Kaczynski. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to welcome you very warmly. My name is Sultelena Kner and I am the curator of the Paderewski exhibition at the National Museum. Today we have uh, a very special meeting, let's say a special lecture, one of many lectures that uh, are accompanying this exhibition. However, this one is indeed exceptional because it has been co-organized uh, uh, by the American Embassy uh, in Warsaw. And let me introduce to you uh, Mr. Dan Hastings, uh, who will introduce our guest today. Uh, thank you very uh, much, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, we um, would like to thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to be here uh, with you today at the National Museum in Warsaw. My name is Daniel Hastings, and I am the new cultural attaché at the American Embassy. I've been to Poland for only seven months, uh, together with my uh, wife and three children. Uh, we like Poland uh, very much. It's a, a country um, of a rich history and a tradition, is something that we find extremely pleasant. Um, our stay here in Poland we find very pleasant. This uh, week uh, I had um, the great uh, opportunity to accompany uh, Professor John Radziwowski. Um, who uh, is a professor at the University of Alaska. He is fourth generation uh, 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 American of Polish descent. And we uh, have been to Katowice, Opole, and Wrocław. And now uh, we have this uh, opportunity to be here with you today in Warsaw. Uh, Professor um, Radziwowski um, has a very broad experience um, as far as um, our common history goes, uh, Polish-American history, and I think that we hope that this is going to be interesting to you to find out who and uh, how uh, links or connects uh, Poland and the United States, uh, not just uh, the leaders, but uh, also the simple folk. So um, thank you very much for this, and I hope that you'll find this interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Pani Curator, uh, to the uh, Council uh, who are here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will talk this evening, uh, this afternoon, about uh, Paderewski and about Wilson, but also about the role of the United States in the rebirth of Poland. Um, if you have not had a chance to see the exhibit that they have put on upstairs, I think it's a very wonderful exhibit on Paderewski. And I encourage you all to, uh, to go and see it. I believe it's something that Paderewski would himself have liked. I was here last night uh, when they opened the exhibit and there were many speeches. Uh, Paderewski was a great musician, but also uh, someone who uh, loved Poland uh, and saw himself as a leader. And I think it would have pleased him greatly uh, to hear the, the words that people spoke last night and to see uh, that his name is so well remembered. Now, the rebirth of a free Poland after 123 years of foreign colonial subjugation was one of the most improbable yet important events of modern history. Now, credit for Poland's independence goes first and foremost to the Poles themselves. It was their efforts that were paramount in uh, really recreating and sustaining a free Poland. And although the Polish Second Republic was, to say the least, an imperfect state, during its short 21-year existence, in spite of its social and ethnic divisions, its political faults, and its material poverty, its people developed a tremendous reservoir of civic and spiritual strengths that allowed it to resist to the utmost the power of the two most cruel and ruthless totalitarian states the world has ever known. Now, if we think about this as an important event for the history of Poland, of course, uh, but it's also an important event for European and world history. And to illustrate this, uh, we use our imagination a moment and think about what the world would be like if Poland had not regained its independence in 1939, or sorry, in 1918. Who in 1920, 
uh, would have resisted the march of the Bolsheviks into Central Europe? Uh, who in 1939 would have stood up against the, the rise of totalitarianism? Uh, and what would the world look like if there was no independent Poland? So this is an important event, not merely for the Poles themselves, but one that ought to be understood in the context of a larger European and world history. As I said, the main credit for Poland's rebirth goes to the Poles themselves, but they didn't achieve this in the void. Now the idea of recreating a truly free Poland didn't have a lot of friends to begin with. But those that it did have were quite important, and first and foremost among these was the United States of America. Of all the great powers of that time, America's role in the rebirth of Poland was perhaps the most significant. Now there are three important parts of this uh, role. Hopefully that's a better microphone. Uh, there are three important parts of uh, this role that America played in helping Poland regain its independence, uh, two of which you're probably quite familiar with already, uh, and one of which, however, is less well known. And I'll, and I'll talk about all three of those uh, this afternoon. Now, in many ways, Pol uh, America's role in Poland's rebirth was a triumph of idealism. Americans had always seen themselves as standing apart from the rest of the world. After all, people left uh, the US, uh, Europe and other places to come to the USA to make a new start for themselves. Uh, the, uh, uh, the idea of America was to uh, separate itself from the problems of Europe. Uh, Europe was seen as, as old, as tired. Uh, America would be a fresh start. Um, this is reflected in the um, motto of the, of the USA, which you can see on the back of the dollar, one of the mottos of the USA, uh, which is Novus Ordum Secularum, which is a new order for the ages. Um, but in the 1890s, from the 1890s really to the beginning of World War I, this idea was under increasing threat. Americans found it harder and harder to separate themselves from the problems of the world due to international trade, uh, the growth of international trade, new military technology, uh, and the growth of colonial empires in both Asia and Africa. And this made the U.S. seem ever less secure. The outbreak of the First World War put America's ability to remain apart from uh, the problems of the world at risk as never before. From 1914 to 1917, American President Woodrow Wilson, who's here, he's looking over my shoulder here as well, I have to be very careful, uh, not, not to say anything bad about him. it looks like he'll be upset at me, be upset at me. Uh, is uh, the, uh, really tried very hard to keep America out of the war while protecting American interests abroad. But this proved to be nearly impossible. Ultimately, it would be impossible. Despite the profound differences between America and Europe, there were also deep ties of blood, of commerce, and of sentiment that bound the US and Europe together. America could not ignore Europe, and Europe increasingly needed the United States, especially as the, uh, the, the, the demand for blood and treasure grew as the war went on and the losses mounted. So by 1916, America was increasingly drawn into the conflict, and yet Americans, and Wilson in particular, wanted to uh, be very ambivalent about taking sides in the conflict. Uh, Wilson wanted to use America's strength, and particularly his, both his potential military strength and his financial strength, to uh, bring about a peace, and not favoring one side or the other. At least that was his initial goal. So the first and best known aspect of America's role in helping Poland was in fact the role of Wilson himself. Um, his place in American history is undergoing a lot of change. Uh, historians are re-examining his role within uh, American culture. Uh, but his role in international affairs is fairly well known and fairly well understood. Now Wilson was a progressive idealist, uh, even a utopian, so he had this idea of a kind of utopia for the future. He believed that rational men uh, could solve most problems in the world if they just sat down at the table together uh, with goodwill and willing to put aside their short-term interests. Now this is a rather elitist approach, and as we know, this sounds like a very beautiful idea, as we know in practice, of course, things don't always work out quite so well. Uh, this is a rather elitist approach as well. That this counts the idea of nations as having uh, perhaps distinct and permanently conflicting interests. 
Uh, it also has little place for the role of democracy or, or mass movements in setting foreign policy. Well, Wilson tended to see the world, the, the problems of the world, uh, in theoretical and moral terms. He was, after all, a history professor like myself. Uh, and so he had an ability to kind of look at things from the top down, but really uh, more in a theoretical sense. But Wilson's idealism uh, wasn't completely unmoored from, un from concrete reality. Uh, he had recognized the limits of American power, to be sure. But to understand America's role, we have to start with the understanding how improbable uh, this truly, uh, Poland's return uh, to the map of Europe truly was. Um, when the war began, of course, in 1940, as we know, in uh, 1795, Poland lost the last vestiges of its independence in the, the final partition of Poland. But in 1914, the three powers that had destroyed Poland uh, in, the end of the in the end of the 1700s were still in control. Uh, the Austrians, uh, Austro-Hungarians, Russians, and uh, Prussian or German, uh, German Empire. Um, and, and so when we look, we look back on the events of 1918, it seems obvious to us in hindsight, we know how the story turned out. But at the time when people were living through it, it was not this clear. Uh, things are much clearer in hindsight always. Um, and even in 1917, when Wilson really first begins to put forward plans for peace uh, and to mention the role of Poland in that, uh, all those three empires were still in existence. The Russians were, uh, were still hadn't been knocked out of the war. Germany was very strong. Even Austria-Hungary uh, was still in the war. In 1918, when Wilson put forward the famous 14 points, uh, Germany was in control of all of the former land, almost all the former lands of the uh, Old Dutch Mospolita. Uh, and uh, they were preparing for a massive new offensive on the Western Front. So as Wilson's looking at the cause of Poland, he's not looking at this in terms of the military situation or the political situation, uh, because those, uh, if you looked at those from a sort of rational point of view, uh, they would sort of argue against possibly recreating Poland. Um, so Wilson's call is really based on this, uh, this idealism that he has. And it's that idealism that's the key to understanding America's role. But the interesting thing is that idealism during the First World War is in very short supply. Now, World War I and many historians, uh, both in the USA and Europe, have likened the First World War to a suicide attempt on the part of Europe or perhaps Western civilization. Uh, there were four years of slaughter at places like Verdun, Passchendaele, uh, and in Tannenberg. Um, no state or leader had proven to have the ability to either uh, bring peace to the negotiating table or victory on the battlefield. And the slaughter that was occurring, and this occurred, of course, at a time when, uh, prior to the war, uh, new technology and new scientific discoveries seemed to open up the promise of a, a world of limitless possibilities of solving the material wants of, of, of mankind. Uh, people were, in many ways, very optimistic uh, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries. Uh, it looked like there was no limits to, to human power. Um, but in 1914, of course, all that, that technology, that science, seems to turn on humanity. Instead of creating uh, cures for diseases, terrible new weapons are being created. Poison gas, machine guns, uh, tanks. Uh, and for all the physical horrors of the war, uh, the ideological aftermath is even worse. The war called into question uh, really the, uh, a lot of people's ideas about politics, about culture. Um, and, and set the stage for terrible new uh, ideas, Marxism, fascism, and ultimately, of course, Nazism. Uh, in many ways, if you, uh, there's a, uh, a, a Italian um, a document called the uh, Futurist Manifesto, and if you read the Futurist Manifesto, it's almost like a prediction for what's going to happen. It's a really dark vision of humanity, and World War I uh, seemed to be fulfilling that dark vision of humanity. So it's against this backdrop that we have to view America's role. How, how strange it is then that a president with these, with these great idealistic uh, plans uh, is, is, walks into a situation that seems so dark and so foreboding, um, so hostile to, to this kind of idealism. And how much more extraordinary is it that in order to get his, push his ideas forward, he teams up not with another politician, but with a, uh, uh, with a musician, um, someone who's not a politician, 
uh, who's a, a, a very uh, uh, international celebrity, if you will. And so to understand Wilson's role, we have to understand also the role of Paderewski. Uh, and it's, this is um, very important because up until the beginning of the war, there's no evidence that Wilson had any interest in Poland. Uh, there were hundreds of thousands of Polish immigrants coming to the United States. Uh, Wilson was very much an elitist. Uh, he was, certainly wasn't interested, and most of those Polish immigrants were factory workers or miners. Uh, Wilson certainly wasn't interested in them very much, uh, even his voters, even his potential voters. Uh, and so he had no particular sympathy uh, or background that would um, tell us, uh, sort of predict uh, that he would have some, some uh, um, interest in Poland. Um, so it's really understanding Paderewski uh, is how we understand Wilson's uh, uh, um, interest in Poland. Now Paderewski at the time was probably the most famous musical uh, celebrity in the world. Uh, he, his, his charisma, his good looks, his trademark of barely tamed golden hair. If you look at the, the portrait uh, that they use for the, uh, for the exhibit, uh, that, that's a, one of the best portraits, but he had almost like a halo surrounding his head. Um, he had tremendous talent as a musician. He toured constantly uh, throughout the world. Um, he pioneered this idea, really, of, of almost like solo concerts, where only he would come out. He was the center of everything, and he uh, had uh, crowds of adoring women. He was like a rock star of his day, uh, and um, like into the Beatles, perhaps. He had crowds of young women, uh, sometimes with scissors, would chase him around, trying to snip off pieces of his hair. He was so popular. In fact, we know and from some of his letters and memoirs was that there were times when he had to actually hide in his hotel room from his fans that they were so eager. And so he was really the most famous um, artist in the world at the time. And it's interesting, if you go to the internet or social media today, there's not many people from the early part of the 20th century and certainly not many musicians that are still talked about or mentioned on uh, social media today. But there's many uh, what we call urban legends that continue to circulate about Paderewski. Um, and he's the only cultural figure of any, of any type that, that these things continue to circulate. And most of them are not true. Uh, but they're very interesting to, to uh, think about why these continue to circulate. And one of them, uh, the, the, you, you can go online and find this if you want, uh, is uh, this uh, mother uh, has a little boy, and the little boy is very interested in learning to play piano. And so she takes the little boy to a Paderewski concert, and they sit down in the front row, and uh, they're waiting for the concert to begin. Uh, and the mother gets distracted, and the little boy wanders off. And as the concert's about to begin, the, uh, the curtains open, and there's the little boy. He's wandered up onto stage. He's sitting at the piano playing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And the maestro walks out. He doesn't say anything. The boy doesn't see him. And he comes up behind the boy, and he adds the bass line. And then as the boy is playing, he adds another part. And he whispers to the boy, keep playing, keep playing. Now, there's no evidence of this ever happened. It's a nice story, and it's used to show, uh, you know, sort of the, the importance of determination. Um, but all of the stories of Paderewski that circulate, I say many of them not true, are uh, focused on his interest of young, in young people. Uh, he did have a great passion for helping young people. Uh, he had prizes uh, for, uh, for young musicians, uh, particularly young pianists, uh, that were given both in Europe and in the United States. Uh, and so it's very interesting that even after more than 100 years of his, his fame, his now, you know, except for classical music fans, uh, is, is, you know, no, he's no longer very famous, but these continue to circulate, and it's very interesting. Now, he was also a very charitable person, very interested in charity, and uh, gave, uh, gave generously of his time and, and his money. Uh, the Grunwald Monument in Krakow, for example, he helped to, he helped to fund that. Uh, but this was a time in America when most Poles that were living there were, as I said, factory workers or miners. They were really uh, uh, suffered quite a bit of discrimination, uh, particularly in their jobs. Um, and so Paderewski stood apart from, from the other Poles. Um, and he had access. He knew all the wealthiest Americans. He knew the industrialists like Rockefeller and, and Carnegie. Uh, he knew he uh, was actually knew Mark Twain uh, before Mark Twain passed away, the famous American writer. So he had access to the, to the people of, of wealth and power. Now, when the war broke out in Poland, uh, 
1914, and I'll show you, actually, I'll advance to this one. Uh, when the war broke out in 1914, this is a um, cartoon from a newspaper, Narodopolski, Polski, uh, which is still being published in the United States. It's one of the oldest um, Polish newspapers, although parts of it, most of it's now in English. And this is the type of cartoon that would have um, used to illustrate what was happening in Poland. But in the summer of 1914, as the war broke out, uh, Russian, Austro-Hungarian, and German armies were marching across Polish lands. And there was tremendous destruction unleashed. Uh, and there were uh, huge battles being fought with great loss of life. But as the armies marched through, they burned and destroyed a great deal. They uh, uh, causing refugees, uh, people lost their homes. And so in 1914, by the end of 1914, Poland emerges on the world scene, not as a political issue, but as a humanitarian issue. Uh, and so this is where Paderewski begins to get involved. And this begins an effort uh, in 1914 to provide humanitarian relief, particularly food, medicine, and supplies to Poland, as well as to Belgium and Serbia and other areas affected by the war. In the United States, the Polish immigrant community had developed an extensive array of institutions, uh, religious, social, cultural, and political. And these institutions were mobilized to, do, to create aid uh, for Poland and to raise money for Poland. And this type of cartoon would have been, uh, would have been part of that. Uh, charities in the U other uh, regular sort of mainstream charities in the U.S. and other countries also began to organize supplies. Now, from the beginning of this effort, Podrzewski sought to play a leading role, uh, and he was not the only prominent Pole to do so. Uh, for example, the opera singer Marcella Kochanska Sembrick uh, created a circle of wealthy New Yorkers. She was a famous uh, opera singer at the, at the Metropolitan Opera at the time. Uh, and they were, uh, he, she had a, a group of her friends that were developing Polish relief as well. But as the leading musical celebrity of the day, Paderewski played a highly significant role in bringing the plight of Poland to people's attention. Uh, his connections with the wealthy and the well-connected paid great dividends as a result of this. Um, and so aid for suffering Poland became a fashionable humanitarian cause of the day. And it brought together Americans from many different walks of life, from immigrant miners to uh, wealthy industrialists and society matrons. Now, despite the outpouring of goodwill for the cause of Poland, by the beginning of 1916, it was clear that this effort was a failure. The biggest cause of the failure was the war situation itself. The British were blockading the continent, uh, not allowing neutral ships to bring supplies to either Germany, Austria, Hungary. Uh, and of course, in order for the aid to get to Poland, uh, they would have had to loosen their blockade and let ships in. Uh, but at the same time, Germany and Austria, Hungary were, uh, were engaged in this war as well. And uh, the, particularly in, in Austria, Hungary, the, the bureaucracy had begun to come apart. Uh, the uh, supplies were not getting to people. Uh, there was already people going hungry in the streets of Vienna uh, by, by 1916. Uh, Germany was also suffering severe shortages, rationing uh, throughout the country. Um, and so they would have had to guarantee, the British would have had to guarantee that uh, to let the supplies through. Uh, but the Germans and the Austrian authorities would have had to agree to, uh, to actually let the supplies to the Poles. Uh, not use them for their own war effort or for their own people. Um, and if you think about it, the very idea that, that the Austrian authorities would allow people to starve on the streets of Vienna while allowing aid to get to Poland, that would have been politically impossible. Uh, and the same thing on, on the Germans. Now this, by the way, is Paderewski holding uh, some dolls. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of one of those in a moment. Uh, the uh, picture over here is of Helena Paderewska. She also played a very important role. Uh, it's not as mentioned, I think, in history books, perhaps. Uh, she, fo uh, she was the initiator of the Polish White Cross, uh, which at that time there was no, because Poland wasn't independent, there was not a, a Polish branch of the Red Cross. And so she formed this actually to help the, what would become the Polish army in France. Uh, but she played also a very important role in the fundraising, also in Paderewski's uh, social efforts to reach out to, to wealthy people in the USA. This, by the way, is one of the dolls. Uh, these were made by uh, American women, uh, often, most often Polish women, 
uh, very inexpensive, uh, but they were sold at different benefits to raise money for the cause of Poland. This one happens to come from a online auction site. Uh, there's, um, these are co collected by people sometimes, people who collect dolls. Uh, I think the value is between 100 and 200 US dollars actually. Uh, for uh, for this one, if they're they're in good condition, uh, but they're they're very interesting uh, historical artifacts. So the the effort to get aid to Poland was failing. Uh, the, the aid wasn't getting through. Aid was being collected. Money was being collected, but the aid was not getting through. Now the other problem, in addition to the war situation, was actually Paderewski himself. For all of his undoubted um, uh, uh, great, great qualities, his talent, uh, his love of Poland, his generosity, like many celebrities, he was very jealous. Uh, he didn't like to share the limelight with other people. In fact, he spent a great deal of time actually trying to undermine uh, Marcella Kohanska Sembrick's effort at, um, uh, at aid, because he wanted to be the paramount leader of that aid effort. Um, he was also a very poor politician, um, and this is this becomes more obvious when he engages in politics in, in independent Poland after 1918. Uh, but he had he saw politics in very lofty terms, uh, very idealistic terms. He saw the cause of Poland almost in a very romantic light. He had really little, very little ability, very, in, very little interest uh, in expressing things as policy, uh, developing a political policy. So he didn't have a plan for the future of Poland. Uh, he saw Poland as a kind of a cause, almost like a romantic cause. Um, but despite all of that, he was able to maintain effort, uh, the effort at Polish relief and to really become the, uh, the leader of it. Uh, the leaders of American Polonia at that time, as I say, they had an, quite a number of organizations. Uh, but they, they realized that even though working with Paderewski could be sometimes difficult, he gave them access to the wealthy and the well-connected in America. And so uh, they, they um, he, even though he didn't treat them with much respect sometimes, they recognized that it was a great advantage to work with him. The irony is that the failure of the humanitarian effort uh, to get aid to Poland opened up the door for political action. Uh, a great deal of sympathy had been built up for Poland. Uh, Paderewski had, had brought this to the attention of a lot of Americans. And so as a result of that, Paderewski was able to pivot uh, to change the humanitarian effort into a political one. Now in 1915, Paderewski met Edward M. House, and you know, often known as Colonel House. He wasn't really a colonel, but he's often called Colonel House. Uh, and he was a close friend of President Wilson. He was an advisor, particularly on foreign policy, kind of an informal envoy, an informal ambassador. And uh, both uh, Paderewski and his wife met uh, House and, ha and House's wife. Uh, and they began to uh, socialize together, uh, have dinner together, and through House, Paderewski meets Wilson. Uh, and the, Wilson and Paderewski um, strike up a conversation, they begin to like each other, and they'll remain in contact throughout this entire period. Now Paderewski's relationship with Wilson and House, of course, could not have come at a better time. President Wilson had sought to keep America out of the European war, but by 1916, this was becoming increasingly difficult. And uh, America was being drawn closer and closer to the conflict, uh, especially as it tried to maintain trade relations uh, and, and normal, uh, normal relations with the rest of the world. In 1916, Wilson wrote as part of a draft proposal uh, for peace, the position of neutral nations has been rendered all but intolerable. Their commerce is interrupted. Their industries checked and diverted. The lives of their people are put in constant jeopardy. Now, Wilson viewed the US as uniquely positioned to mediate a possible peace settlement and create a new international order that would prevent future wars. Um, and he's thinking through how to do this. Uh, and it's right at this time is when he meets Paderewski. And this is why the relationship is so important. Uh, at this time, uh, Wilson and the United States were becoming the most important political players in the world. Not only was there America's potential military strength, and we remember that the Europeans are killing each other in large numbers at this time, but also, in addition to killing each other, they're using up a huge amount of resources, and they need credit. Uh, the, they're, they're actually getting credit from the American bankers uh, to pay for the war effort. 
Um, and Wilson realizes this, and he wants to use America's leverage, not just over the, the Germans and the Austrians, but also over the French and the British. Wilson was very suspicious, even though he, we, the United States ultimately joined with the British and the French, Wilson was quite suspicious of both the British and the French. Uh, and so um, he wasn't necessarily ready to, to jump in to help them. Now central to Wilson's vision of a future peace was the resolution of outstanding culture, uh, territorial conflicts. Uh, in Wilson's view, imperial competition between the great powers over land and resources, secret diplomacy, and the building of ever larger militaries had destabilized Europe. This wasn't, to, in Wilson's view, uh, a continuation of old conflicts, but this was actually a very new and dangerous phase in, in European history. Uh, and so Wilson was deeply concerned about this, and he wanted to return to a more rules-based international order. And so regions of conflict, and Wilson would have included Alsace-Lorraine, he would have included Ireland, as well as Poland in that list, needed to be resolved uh, before Europe could actually um, have peace. Wilson's vision, as he explained to the French ambassador, was of a scientific, and he used the term scientific, and just peace, one that would not create any new Alsace-Lorraines. And so Podolevsky's intervention occurred just at the moment that Wilson is trying to think through how to develop a just and scientific peace. And if Alsace-Lorraine comes to symbolize the problems in Western Europe, so Poland will come to symbolize the problems in Central and Eastern Europe. Wilson's intervention on the Polish question would elevate Poland to something more than just a pawn on the chessboard of European politics. But he's going to make Poland into a moral issue first before it becomes a political issue. The irony of this is it plays exactly into Podrzewski's strengths. Uh, as I say, he was a very poor politician. He had very little a grasp of policy. Uh, he had no vision of what the, the government of a future Poland or the shape of a future Poland would look like. Uh, but Wilson wasn't interested in that. Wilson was interested, it was that moral vision, that romantic vision that, that Paderewski had that caught Wilson's attention. And because of this, uh, Poland becomes for Wilson a paramount example of all that had gone wrong. Now, normally this would have, it, Paderewski's inability to, to, to talk about what a future Poland would look like would have been a terrible disadvantage. Uh, and of course, there were men like Josef Pilsudski or Roman Domowski who already had very clear visions of what Poland ought to look like in the future. Uh, and, uh, but Wilson wouldn't, wasn't interested in this. In fact, in, in 1918, uh, Domowski meets with Wilson, and Domowski provides a long kind of detailed idea of what he thinks Poland ought to look like. Wilson is very polite, but says, no thank you, I'm not very interested, and just kind of ignores everything Domofsky says. Um, and so it's really significant to, to think about what Paderewski did not do, and that's, uh, again, articulate a clear political position. That romantic vision is what Wilson really catches his attention and helps to elevate Poland to, to the, a major cause. Now, because of this, Poland becomes the primary symbol of everything that's gone wrong in Europe. Um, in 1917, in January of 1917, and this is a year, more, really a year before the, uh, the 14 points, Wilson gives a speech called Peace Without Victory, and he gives this to the U.S. Senate. Now, this speech is often overlooked. The 14 points is very famous, but this speech is actually in some ways more important than the 14 points because it really lays out Wilson's vision for, for what, the, um, uh, what the future ought to look like. It's also important to remember that in 1917, the US was not yet at war, nor was Wilson convinced that he had to go to war against Germany. Uh, he still held out the hope that he could, the US would uh, stay out directly out of the conflict. And in, in his speech, Wilson writes, he says the following, no peace can last, or ought to last, which does not recognize and accept the principle that governments derive all their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's a very American statement for those of you who've read the Declaration of Independence, by the way. 
that no right exists anywhere to hand peoples about from sovereignty to sovereignty as if they were property. I take it for granted, for instance, if I may venture upon a single example, that statesmen everywhere are agreed that there should be a united, independent, autonomous Poland, and that henceforth inviolable security of life, of worship, of industrial and social development should be guaranteed to all peoples who have lived hitherto under the power of governments devoted to a faith and purpose hostile to their own. Now, in this speech, uh, Poland is the only country, it's Poland, and only Poland is the only country that he mentions in this speech. This is why it's so significant. Uh, so it's really, uh, Poland is like the paramount example of everything that's gone wrong. It's his, his way to show people what he wants to do with the future. Now, a year later, the famous 14 points, Wilson will again reiterate this, that there needs to be a free Poland with access to the sea. So that's the point 13. But he's elaborating an idea that he's already thought through a year before. Okay, so that early intervention by Podorowski is important. So Podorowski's role then is to personify and express a moral and personal appeal on behalf of his country. It's Podorowski's charisma, it's his forceful character. Everything that had made him an international celebrity was the decisive factor in his influence over Wilson. Um, and likewise, uh, his inability to express a political program, which would have been a terrible disadvantage under other circumstances, now becomes an advantage. And so through the 14 points program, Wilson elevates Poland to a central issue in, in peace negotiations. And without that advocacy, and without Podorowski's friendship with Wilson, Poland would have remained a secondary issue, um, and the wishes of her people would have been lost in the political struggle that followed the war. So Wilson and America give Poland a, a seat at the table of European politics, maybe not a commanding seat, but certainly a seat for the first time in 123 years. And of course, the United States will be the first nation to recognize the new Poland. Now Wilson realizes, uh, despite all of, for all of his idealism, uh, this, is, this, by the way, is a poster. Uh, this was done by um, Władysław Benda, who's a very famous uh, Polish and American graphic artist. So some of his work is actually up in the uh, exhibit upstairs. And he did quite a few posters uh, for, for the Polish cause in this period. Uh, but it's important, when you think about Wilson, I, Wilson had no real interest in shaping the future of Poland. Uh, and in fact, he, he later will commission a study of American experts on, on Poland, other, some other countries in Europe, uh, but he doesn't really seem to pay much attention to the, to the results of that. So according to Wilson, America, Poland should be, uh, you know, correspond to ethnic and linguistic boundaries, and if, if you've, as you've studied Polish history, you know this was practically impossible to do. Uh, and they should have some access to the sea. Uh, so this results, of course, in protracted wrangling over problems like Silesia uh, over Gdańsk, uh, and uh, it leaves the status of the new Poland in a very chaotic situation. Um, and, and really, Poland will emerge after a series of conflicts, uh, the most decisive of which, of course, was the, uh, the Polish-Soviet War, which will turn back the major communist invasion of Europe. Uh, but Wilson's intervention in the Polish question is really kind of a, really reflects that American idealism uh, and his own idealism as well. Uh, how he's wrestling through these questions of lasting European peace and what America's role ought to be. Now, this friendship with Podorowski, based on this lofty idealism, really is going to set the tone for U.S.-Polish relations. Uh, he's a very hands-off approach. In contrast, the, the British and the French were very interested in. Um, you know, shaping the future of Poland for their own purposes, but the Americans will stand back and, and uh, sort of let, let things be. Um, and so it's Wilson's hands-off approach along with the, the role of President Hoover, future President Hoover that I'll talk about in a moment, uh, that really helps to guarantee the reservoir of goodwill uh, between, uh, between, toward the USA on the part of Poles uh, that really a hundred years has not yet erased. Now the second critical way, of course, that the US helped uh, Poland was uh, the American relief, the role of American relief agencies uh, at the end of the war. By 1918, Poland was utterly devastated. Armies had marched back and forth across the country, fighting and looting as they went. Uh, the uh, refugees fled before the troops, so there was thousands of thousands of homeless people. Uh, farms were wrecked, 
uh, and the food supplies were taken, uh, whatever, what food supplies uh, remained were taken by the German and Austrian authorities to feed their own populations. Um, as, as the war went on and uh, factories in Germany began to fall apart, they began to run out of uh, parts, they, they came to Poland actually and cannibalized uh, the factories in Poland and took the spare parts, and so the factories weren't running either. Uh, material losses in Poland t totaled about $10 billion. It was hunger, malnutrition, and a lack of shelter. Uh, so people were susceptible to disease. There were epidemics of cholera, typhoid, influenza that were ravaging the population. And by the end of the war, thousands were dying every day of, of illness and, and hunger. Um, the situation, if you see the pictures from, from Syria, or other, other places in the world where there are conflicts going on, really that was Poland in 1918 in, in the, eyes of, the eyes of the world. Now, aside from these terrible uh, conditions, Poland is also under direct threat from hostile neighbors, and the most dangerous of which was the aggressive and genocidal Bolshevik regime that had taken control of Russia after a bloody civil war. Establishing a free Poland, then, was for just the first step. Poles had to rebuild their country and fend off foreign invasions. So the second major way that America helps the new Poland was in the American relief effort. And this was the, uh, led by future President H Herbert Hoover. Uh, he led what was known as the American Relief Effort, or AR, Amer American Relief Administration, ARA. Now, Hoover was an engineer. He was a Quaker, or the Society of Friends. Uh, he later, in 1928, become president of the United States. He was a great humanitarian, but also a very effective administrator. Um, this was really the, the, the key to understanding Hoover. He wanted to accomplish things. Uh, his plan, this is why Hoover, his plan actually created the Hoover Dam, the famous Hoover Dam in the United States. Uh, so he was also a civil engineer. Um, now, American supplies were being sent to war to er, in many areas of Europe at this time, but the effort in Poland was the, was the largest. Uh, this was the largest humanitarian effort in the world up until World War II, the end of World War II. Uh, so really quite significant. Uh, there was really uh, nothing, nothing to compare it with up until the end of World War II. Um, it's thanks to Hoover that tons of uh, food were sent to the country and quickly and fairly distributed. Uh, he was able to overcome all logistical problems. Uh, he was able to work with all the different uh, political groups in Poland, all the different religious and ethnic communities in Poland. Uh, he was really trusted by everyone. By 1920, two million meals a day are being provided by the U.S. Uh, to people in Poland. Um, in addition to that, he's, over, he's bringing in clothing and, and medicine as well. Um, and so he, he's able to sort of get all this uh, through. Now, he's also important because the original American aid effort was designed to end in 1919. Uh, throughout Europe, but Hoover sees that there is a need in Poland to continue the aid effort beyond 1919. Uh, in that year, he visits Warsaw. He sees thousands of children dressed in rags, uh, without shoes. He sends a few telegraphs off, and within days, there are 700,000 winter coats, 700,000 pairs of shoes that are on their way to the United States. And all of these were distributed before the, before the onset of winter that year. Um, and of course, he's also arranging medicine for people uh, to be sent, uh, providing help for the victims. Um, and, and because the uh, relief effort extend, Hoover will extend the relief effort through 1922, uh, American aid is also important in helping people, uh, refugees caused by the Polish Bolshevik War. So people who were displaced by the conflicts that occurred afterwards were also being helped uh, through this aid effort. It's thanks to Hoover and the ARA that the lives of millions of Poles were saved from disease and starvation. Now there's other aspects of this. Now those two aspects I would say are probably the most well known uh, of, the, of the different aspects of American aid. There are, we can walk around Warsaw and you can see monuments and streets and squares named for, for Hoover and, and Paderewski of course, uh, but also for Wilson. And he, even Colonel House has a little monument over on the Praga side. Uh, and so those parts are relatively well known. But there's a part that's not very well known here in Poland, I think too in the United States, and that's the role played by ordinary Americans, and particularly Americans of Polish descent in helping Poland. Uh, by 1914, American Polonia was over two million strong. Now these were Poles who'd immigrated to the USA since the 1850s and their American-born children. And they lived mainly in the Great Lakes region, the Midwest, and the Eastern Seaboard. Most of them were urban factory workers or coal miners. Uh, some, a few were farmers as well. 
Uh, they were quite poor by American standards, although they made significant uh, economic and cultural progress, uh, creating hundreds of schools, libraries, churches, newspapers, and other organizations. Now, they became uh, much more active in the cause of Poland following the Kulturkampf uh, that was initiated by German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck uh, that was aimed at repressing Poles and Catholics in Germany, as well as by the 1905 revolution in Russia and the, the school strikes uh, in Prussia the, the, the year later. And so by 1907, uh, Polish organizations in the USA were sending delegations to international meetings and conferences, uh, to the International Women's Conferences uh, uh, as well, um, highlighting the cause of Poland uh, for a world audience. They'd also begun to raise money for Polish causes. Now when the war began, Poles in America developed two umbrella organizations. Uh, one of these was the socialist-oriented Komitet Obrony Narodowy, or National Defense Committee, but there was also the much larger Catholic-led Polska Rada Narodowa, or Polish National Council, and this was the one actually that worked closely with Paderewski. Uh, in October of 1914, the PRN joined with uh, the Chicago-based Polish National Relief Committee to form an umbrella organization. But even before the war started, though, uh, Poles in the USA were actually um, uh, already collecting quite a bit of money. In the spring of 1914, there were a series of natural disasters in Galicia, uh, and uh, the, the Polish Roman Catholic Union, or Zednoczenia Polska Rymsko Katolicka w Ameryce, had quickly raised $12,000 uh, to aid the victims of the flood. Now, $12,000 doesn't seem like a lot, but at the time, that was actually a huge amount of money. Now, from the start of the war until 1922, uh, Polish Americans raised about $50 million for Poland. Now, that's $50 million in 1920s dollars. Uh, if you translate it in today's, in today's currency, that'd be about 600 million US dollars, or about 2 billion zloty. Okay, so it's a significant, it is a very significant amount of money. And, and this, by the way, is uh, from 1917. Uh, I, I actually, from my research, actually interviewed, there's a, a lady here, uh, I don't remember which one she is, uh, that I interviewed when she was very elderly, uh, who, who was very active in this as, as a young girl. Uh, but they, people would go around like this, they would dress in different uh, historical or military dress with children. Um, here's another one with two, uh, three uh, sisters uh, who they, would, they stood out on street corners in the city of Minneapolis uh, with donation boxes and got donations from people uh, coming. Uh, and so the, uh, the amount, that amount of money, that 50 million included 5 million for the Polish National Fund, uh, 1.5 million for the Polish Army, and uh, three million for clothing and food aid. Uh, Polish Americans also bought large amounts of Polish government bonds. In addition, they provided an estimated $30 million in direct assistance to family members in Poland, so money they actually gave directly to, to relatives in Poland as well. So as the war came to an end and Poland struggled to knit itself together and stand up to foreign invasion, Polish communities in America were being mobilized as never before. And uh, they were holding parish fundraisers, uh, and these were communities, sometimes very small farming communities in places like Texas or Minnesota, uh, up through large communities in places like Chicago or New York. Uh, the parishes would hold special benefits. The school children in the schools would go around collecting pennies and nickels uh, and turn them in. Uh, and this, was a, this has been a point of pride, actually, in many, uh, many places in the U.S. in Polish communities. Uh, and if you read the, uh, the history, the community histories, they're called parish histories, uh, they, they will often mention this. Um, so, for example, uh, the, the, the parish of St. Adelbert of uh, Wojciech uh, in uh, Saint, East St. Louis, Illinois, collected almost $20,000 for Polish relief uh, between 1917 and 1921. And uh, the interesting thing about this, and this is, by the way, in addition to supporting the Polish effort, the Polish relief effort, uh, Polish Americans were also buying $99 million worth of U.S. government bonds to support the U.S. war effort. What's significant about all of this is that this was not, this money was not coming from wealthy Americans. These were people who were on the lowest, um, uh, really the, one of the lowest rungs of the, of the ladder in America, people who often struggled to provide uh, food and clothes for their own families, and yet they were giving this large amount of money uh, for the Polish cause. 
Now, in addition to this, uh, there was um, about 38,000 Polish Americans volunteered for the Polish Armed Forces between 1916 and 1920. And this is another poster by Benda uh, for, for uh, recruiting for the Polish Army prior to 1918. About 24,000 Poles would ultimately serve in the Polish army. Actually, quite a few people who volunteered uh, were too old, but they volunteered anyway, just to uh, kind of make a statement. Uh, and this was the so-called Blue Army or Blankitna Armia. Uh, it saw action, uh, but it was sent to France first. Uh, it served under, it was trained in Canada. Uh, it served uh, uh, as, with the French army, but under Polish colors. Uh, but it saw action in the conflict between Poland and Ukraine uh, and in the Polish-Bolshevik War, uh, where Pol American Poles served with great distinction on the battles for Polish independence, including the Battle of Radzimin and the battles against the, the first Red Cavalry Army. Um, these soldiers were recruited at special recruiting stations that were set up all across the United States. And I say they were then sent to Canada. Here's a couple more. There's a number of these posters. Benda was very, very good at making these posters, and I, th I think he did most of them probably for free. Um, of course, men from American Polonia were not the only ones to, to assist uh, the cause of Polish independence. Uh, it's probably fairly well known uh, is the Kosciuszko Squadron, uh, which was made up mostly of Anglo-Americans uh, who were pilots uh, who helped to join, join the Polish Air Force, uh, and uh, the most led by, among others, uh, Marion Cooper, uh, who, if you've seen the original movie King Kong, uh, Cooper was actually the director of that. There should be a, someone should make a movie of Cooper because he's like the Indiana Jones of his time. He had all these different adventures uh, and that he went on all over the world. And, uh, but the Kosciuszko Flyers were greatly feared actually by the Bolsheviks. So feared that uh, the, the Soviets put a bounty on Cooper's head of uh, half a million rubles. Uh, he was actually shot down, uh, taken captive by the Bolsheviks. Uh, but managed to escape and return to Poland. He was one of two Americans awarded the Virtuti Militari uh, during the Pol uh, uh, as a result of the uh, uh, Polish-Soviet War. Now, it was not simply young men who were um, who were joining, but also young women. Uh, and uh, I showed you uh, before uh, the picture of Helena Podrewska, uh, the Polish White Cross. Uh, the, the, those were a lot of those were most of those were Polish women uh, from the USA. Uh, but this is another organization that's, even, that's a little bit even less well-known, I suppose, than the Polish White Cross. And these were the Grey Samaritans. Uh, these were all women, uh, young women of uh, Polish descent. Uh, they were trained in the U.S. as nurses and social workers, and they were sent to Poland. Now, I was telling you about the American aid that was being sent uh, and administered by future President Hoover. It was these women who were the ones who actually distributed the aid to the people in Poland. Uh, and they were, um, they ran soup kitchens throughout the country, Warsaw, Kalisz, Łódź, Pinsk, Lublin, Vilno, Kielce, Lwów. Um, they organized groups of Polish women uh, into sewing circles to sew clo clothing for, uh, for the poor and for the, the homeless. It was, they were the ones who made sure that the donated food wasn't being stolen or siphoned off by corrupt government officials. Um, and one young woman uh, who was in the Greys wrote back to her family in America, uh, and she wrote, uh, in Kielce, people call us American guards because we're always watching. American relief officials later attributed a lot of the success of their relief effort to these young, to these young women uh, and the role that they played, which I say has largely been forgotten, both in the USA and in, in Poland. Um, one American official reported, the Polish Greys have increased the efficiency of the clothing program by 50%. So 50% more children have received outfits than otherwise that the girls had not been supervising. Herbert Hoover himself paid tribute to them. He said, I'd like to express the gratitude we all owe, the appreciation we all feel for the extraordinary services of the Polish Grey Samaritans. The hardships they've undergone, the courage and resources they've shown in sheer human service is a beautiful tribute to American womanhood. As the American relief program began to come to an end by 1922, a lot of the Greys uh, not stayed in Poland longer. They actually trained social workers, women to be social workers in Poland uh, to, to help continue their work and to provide uh, a group of trained social workers for the new, for the new Poland. So the American contribution uh, to, to the rebirth of Poland is unique in several ways. Um, the first is this was done without any clear overriding political or diplomatic motive. 
I mean, if you look at the French and the French role, for example, in helping Poland at this time, there was a clear French national interest uh, that the French wanted to uh, keep uh, Germany in check. Uh, they didn't want a revival of Germany, and they wanted to keep the Bolsheviks uh, at bay as well. Um, so they have a very clear motive, but there's no such motive for the Americans. This was not, American was withdrawing from Europe at this time. Um, and so really, at best, uh, helping Poland provided only indirect benefit for the American national interest or American security. So this was undertaken to correct the wrongs of the past, as sort of an idealistic expression of international relations based on ideas like self-determination, which at the time was not even part of international law. Now it's very accepted. Back then, before Wilson brought this up, it wasn't, uh, no one had really thought of this. Uh, but it wasn't just a, an idealistic, it uh, wasn't just uh, a, a diplomatic idea, but also humanitarian assistance. That's the second, the second way that this wasn't just uh, a, a diplomatic or political move, but also a humanitarian. Um, and also it was not just between two different governments. Uh, this was a, uh, it was the role of ordinary people and in some ways is the most extraordinary um, the young women and the young men who volunteered to, to do this, many of them had never had maybe left Poland as children. Uh, some of them were born in the USA. A, a lot of them had never even seen Poland before, and yet they left their homes, the safety of their homes, and journeyed to what in Poland at that time was a war zone. Uh, they were journeying to a war zone. They were, they were putting, putting their lives in potential danger uh, to, to help out people they, they'd really never seen before half a world away. Um, and so they really kind of set the tone for this relationship. Uh, that, that uh, is really uh, the USA and Poland are very uh, far apart geographically, uh, but very close in spirit. Uh, and so this really sets the tone for that, that enduring relationship. And with that, I will conclude.